beautiful day. A little chilly, but. <laughs> yeah, that's the off. Yeah, that's the bird. Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Adamsville Presbyterian Church. We're glad to be with you today. We thank Bessie and Neil for decorating all that autumn stuff. It's very, very nice. We like it very much. Um, and Jean from Wellness. I'm sorry that last week we prayed for Candy, Lori Donningham's niece, who had the brain aneurysm, only 39. She passed away on Tuesday, leaving a husband and children, a dad and a mom. So we pray for Candy's family. Also, good friends Carl and uh, Marion Green are both in the hospital. Is this not working? Be with you in a minute, folks. Okay, how about that? Now we're working. Thank you very much. Anyway, um, they're in the hospital. Uh, Carl's up in Hamlet, and Marion in Meanville. Pray <coughs> continuing for Richard the Crazy. Um, anything else to report? Yes. Um, we have a joy this week. Katie has a birthday on Wednesday. Wonderful. Happy. How old are you, Katie? <laughs> Gonna be fifteen. Wow. <laughs> fifteen. Wow. Okay. And um, well, Melita's off on happy birthday for Katie. Okay. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Katie. Happy birthday to you. I am happy for you. That's wonderful. Let's pray. Our Father in God, we ask that you be very close to Candy's family. They're going through so much right now, Lord. Be there to comfort and to give them the hope of eternity so they can see and believe that Candy now is with you. We pray for Carl and Marion. We pray for Rachel. We pray for all of our people who have illnesses. We pray that the Master's touch gently reach out upon them. We ask that as we worship, Lord, you will be present with us to build faith. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We give thanks that we have been born anew into a new life of hope through Jesus. We come before you in worship to give thanks for your eternal love. Invocation and in unison. Our Father, we know that you are always present to hear our prayers. We ask that you would worship you for our hearts and mercy. Send your Holy Spirit to do our hearts. Fill faith as we pray in your name. May we see and follow your purpose as we live our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, hymn number 93, lift up your heads, you mighty gates. <laughs>
only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the sleeping dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Prayer of confession in Jesus Christ, who called us to be a servant to Yet we do not do what he commands. We often are silent when we are should and we should speak. We are useless when we should be useful. We are lazy servants, timid and heartless. We turn neighbors away from your love. Have mercy on us, O God, and through we do not deserve. Forgive us and free us from from sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Assurance of pardon. Believe in God. Believe in good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. This is a worship service that I look forward to every year because we have worldwide communion. Communion is something that is celebrated just by almost every Christian on the face of the earth. And one Sunday a year, we hope to get as many churches as possible from all of the different denominations gathering around to enjoy communion. Now, I've worshipped in a lot of churches in my lifetime. I still remember with delight the church I grew up in in Bellevue. It was called the Fremont Avenue Presbyterian Church. And I love that church. And I know today there are people in that building having communion. And in my lifetime, I've pastored four churches. One in Orwell, which is very near here, is on Route 322 over in Ohio. And I know they're celebrating communion. And I know in Pittsburgh, by a wonderful church there, Valley, the people are gathering at the table to celebrate communion. And up in the area, my church there, they're celebrating communion. And we are here. And it's nice to think of the fact that Christians all over the world, from third world nations to our own country, are coming to the table of the Lord to worship. And I believe the Lord is blessing every single one of those communion services. And I'm also so happy that young people now can take communion. If your parents want you to have it, you can take it. And so all of us here together can have communion. And what it is, is a celebration of Jesus. It's a celebration of God's victory. And the victory was won on Easter Sunday as Jesus came from death to life. And when we celebrate communion, what we're doing is saying, Lord, 
We thank you for all you've done for us. And we promise that we're going to be the best Christians we possibly can. And I believe that Jesus is the unseen host of the communion. And I mean, spiritually, he's present to bless all of the people in the world as they come and as they take communion. So a little bit later, we'll have bread. And the bread symbolizes his body when he died for us. And we'll have the grape juice in the cup. And that symbolizes the fact that his blood was shed for us to forgive us of our sins. And oh, how I love to take communion with you. Okay, I'll be okay. taking communion with a couple of different people in hospice this week. And I love doing it because it's special and it's beautiful. Communion, I think, is one of the most exciting and wonderful gifts that we have. Our Father, we thank you so much for these young people. Protect them and always bring them back to us. Caleb. In Jesus' yeah. name, yes. Yeah. He's got right. allergies thank really bad. Thank you very much. Come on. Let us pray. Lord, each of us in our own way. Bring our cares and concerns before you. Oh Lord God, every hour of every day, we need your presence. We give thanks for the mighty things you do, for the fact that your love endures forever and ever. We pray that you be everywhere to bring peace out of chaos. We ask that that horrid war in the Ukraine end very quickly. And we pray, Lord, that you will give the leaders of the earth the wisdom and the power to do the things that are moral, to end hate and discrimination, to hate injustice, to love the dignity of all life. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with the leaders of this nation. Give them the strength and the wisdom to act morally, to protect our great democracy. Be with those who serve in the armed services. We pray they be kept safe. Protect our firefighters and police our emergency first responders, be with them on every shift, Lord. May none be hurt. We pray that you will heal the sick, that you will give comfort and strength to people who are struggling for an understanding of life. Be with the many who mourn, and with those who come to journey's end before this church worships again. Lord, there's been tremendous devastation in our own country this week because of that horrible hurricane that not only affected Florida, but Georgia, and South Carolina, and North Carolina, and part of Virginia. We pray that you be with the families that lost everything. Give them peace and comfort and hope and the ability where necessary to start over. We pray that such things not happen in the future. We ask that you bless the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single congregation on the face of the earth. Be with everyone as they come to the communion table this day. May they hear that great cry of the Lord Jesus for faith. May we respond everywhere by dedicating ourselves anew to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we pray for Adamsville, because this is the church we know and love so much. Give us a good direction for the future, the ability to be the people you would have us be. And all of this we ask in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but 
to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we sing hymn number 267.
Father and God, again we bring gifts to you. We pray that they be used to strengthen the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you will give each of us a new enthusiasm so we can go into your world and serve you well. In the Master's name we ask it. scripture from the Old Testament is the portion of the 41st Psalm, which is the assurance of God's help and it's a plea for healing. Happy are those who consider the poor. The Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are called happy in the land. You do not give them up to the will of the enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed. In their illness, you heal all their infirmities. As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned a gift to you. And then skipping down to verse 10. But you, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy has not triumphed over me, that you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And for the sermon, I'm turning to Mark, the first chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, 
and the kingdom of God has become near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting nets into the sea, where they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they both left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of John marks the description of Jesus' ministry as it began in the early stages. He was baptized by John the Baptist, and then the Savior experienced in the wilderness his great temptation. And of course, as we all know, Jesus won that battle. Mark says that Jesus began his public witness by preaching the gospel of God and by announcing that the time that had been spoken of by the prophets now had been fulfilled in him. Jesus called upon the world to repent and to believe in the gospel. And that's the exact same thing faithful churches continue to do until this very day. We call upon people to repent, to believe in Jesus Christ, and to believe in the gospel. For Jesus, the kingdom of God was what he was all about. It was the central theme of his teaching. God the Father was the Lord of the universe. God the Father was the Lord of everything in it. Yet most of the world lived then as they do now, as if there were no God. For Jesus, the idea of the kingdom of God combined with his role as the suffering servant, introduced God as the sovereign ruler of the universe. People were to faithfully obey the rule of God. When Jesus first preached, there definitely was an urgency to his message. But the time was at hand. When the Lord was going to perform his mighty act of deliverance, his ministry on earth was to last slightly less than three years. And it all culminated on the cross of Calvary and with his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. So from the very beginning, Jesus set out to associate himself with a group of people who would not only be with him during his earthly ministry, but who would be charged with the responsibility of leadership within the first church following the resurrection. Mark writes that at this time, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee, and he found men casting their nets into the sea. They were busy at their occupation. And it was there that Jesus would gather to himself his first four disciples. Notice Jesus didn't wait for a religious moment or for some type of a spiritual retreat to call his original disciples. The work he wanted these men to accomplish was fitted to their kind of experience. Jesus was not looking for pious authorities of the past who could utter religious platitudes. He wanted these particular men because they knew how to catch fish. And now they were going to learn how to catch people for the gospel of God. There is an interesting and important fact that comes to light in this passage. Jesus did not mention anything to them about believing on his name. He did not mention to them that he was the Messiah of God. He just looked at them and said, follow me. 
and I will make you fishers of men instead of fishers of fish. The amazing factor is the tremendous force of Jesus' personality that caused these individuals who maybe had seen him or maybe heard him speak a few words previously to change course and to follow him and to become his disciples. Mark indicated that for these men, there was no early preparation that they had to go through. There wasn't a series of long lectures that they had to listen to. The Savior had just put out a call to these people, and he had sufficient charisma that these men did not hesitate to their decision. Later, Peter would indicate that Jesus certainly should appreciate the fact that they gave up everything to follow him. Peter, looking backwards to the event, understood that they had gone through a significant transformation. He wasn't like the rich man who would have an impossible time entering into the kingdom of God. They heard the call, they followed. To be sure, these men made a momentous decision, and for that we can be thankful. They left their nets and followed Jesus. Now notice, when they went catching fish, they didn't have a fishing hook and a line catching them one at a time. What they were using were nets. And they would put those nets out of the boat and they would catch all kind of fish, different varieties. And they would catch many, many fish at one time. And Jesus is saying that those disciples now are to become fishers of men and they are to use not a fishing hook, but a net to reach out and bring all people from all over the world into the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cry that Jesus would have given to the first disciples is identical to the cry he gives to each and every one of us living 2,000 years later. And the cry to become fishers of people will never be silenced as long as there is a human being left on the face of the earth. There is another major point that should be understood in modern evangelism. The idea of the fisherman's net implies that this is going to be a vast operation. People are going to go throughout the whole world and literally drag people to Jesus Christ. Now the net the old fisherman used was a big circular arrangement weighed down with stones and a draw rope so that the fish could be enclosed in a purse. And this fits the analogy perfectly. The disciples above all else were to bring people into the kingdom of God. And one of the tragedies of the modern church is that far too often this challenge has gone unanswered. And I think it is one of the reasons why, in many cases, the church has grown much smaller in this computerized modern age of ours. Instead of trying new methods of evangelism to fit a changing world, instead of attempting to broaden the base of support, somehow churches have become restricted. Too many times, churches become comfortable. They're satisfied with the status quo. Churches always must change with the time. Churches must adapt to modern reality. And I believe the Adamsville Church is very good at this because we do not put up any restrictions upon who comes in this door. We welcome and love all people and we're excited to be able to tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that God loves people to the extent where Christ died on Calvary's cross to bring forgiveness into the world. And if we acknowledge that we are to be fishers of people and that it is our great privilege to take the gospel to the unbelieving world, then we must acknowledge the fact that we must give up some of our own security. We must go out into the world and live the life of love as Jesus lived it. There's another concept in this passage. 
the disciples, after their initial decision, had to prepare for their mission. There is no statement in Mark that suggests that the disciples knew who Jesus was when he called. They didn't have a vast amount of theology. It's brought out that Christ made such an important impression upon them that they were willing to leave their work and to follow him. This account emphasizes the fact that the love and the power of Jesus energizes us in such a way that we automatically know when confronted by him that we should follow him. According to the gospel, the first thing we should do with regard to our relationship to Jesus Christ is make the decision that in all times, in all situations, we are going to follow him. Many modern scholars have raised the question as to whether it's appropriate to make the jump from the knowledge that the original 12 were fishers of men to the concept that we as believers today are to be fishers of people. There are several ways of dealing with this problem. First, I believe we are in the exact same position that the apostles were in. And I believe the answer to the question is a resounding yes. The apostles were called by Jesus to be agents among the people of the world. And in each age that is followed, God has used people in the same way to speak to their Christian contemporaries. And I am certain that if you would go back in this church a hundred years ago, you would have found many men and women who would get up and speak for Christ any time. And we're still that way today. And then the second question, is it possible to be fishers of people when we did not actually walk with Jesus? And again, the answer to that question is yes. The disciples had to learn how to follow Jesus, and so must we. And in modern times, if we're casting that, then we must figure out what Christ's purpose is. And our training comes from worship. It comes from being together in this house of God. It comes from praying together. It comes from really respecting each other. It comes from sharing our faith. So our first step is to emphasize our involvement in the total life of the church. We must understand Jesus' gospel. We have a living record left by the apostles and by Jesus himself when we find that in Scripture. And if we want to appreciate their experience, we need to constantly read over this material and study it. Then maybe we can become fishers of people. In this, we must deal with our own limitations, our inadequacies, and our sins. If the disciples had to fight the same battle, one of the disciples was an outstanding failure. He betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, and that was Judas. Another denied the Lord three times the night in which Jesus was arrested. But that one, Peter, came back, and he was leader of the first church in Jerusalem, and he gave his life for the gospel of God. And I suggest to you that this should provide courage for each and every one of us. For our many failures through faith in jesus christ we know that we are in the same boat as the disciples were in we are no better and we are no worse than are they you and i can be fishers of people for by the power of god we can talk of jesus redemption in such a way that other human beings are not going to think they're not, we're nuts but they're going to believe Christ wants us to live so people can see and believe in him. This is Worldwide Communion. It's my favorite communion service because I see myself tied with all of the Christians from every denomination, from every branch of Christianity, from the Roman Catholic Church to the Eastern Orthodox Church. All of us are believers in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I envision Christians gathering together in huts in Africa, envision them sitting in great cathedrals, 
all of them to receive the new covenant and to make their pledge to Jesus Christ that they will follow him in all of the ways of life. I would challenge this church again to dedicate that each person to become fishers of people. It's time for a new spiritual awakening. I believe that it can and will happen. It would be great if it could happen worldwide today as people celebrate communion. Remember, Jesus is the new covenant. With that is the promise that God remembers our sins no more. With it is the promise and the guarantee that each and one of us have not only life here on earth for the few years we are on earth, but we will have life eternal with Jesus Christ. With this, I would invite each of you to come to the table of the Lord where he is present and where he is the unseen host of our spiritual life. Let's sing. Break out the break. suffer of our Lord Jesus as they were delivered by the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which the Savior was crucified, he took bread and break it and said, take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup when he, the cup when he had supped and said, this is my blood which was shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father and God, as we come to your table, we give you thanks for the great victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the fact that he was willing to go to the cross of Calvary, to be lifted higher than high. And while there, he could cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We thank you for the gift of the resurrection, and for the knowledge that all of us together have been given the guarantee not only of life here, but life eternal. As we come to the bread, Lord, we praise your name for all that you have done for us. We give you mighty thanks. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And Savior took the bread and he gave it to each of his disciples as we now share the bread and the meat.
Jesus said, take eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, we've shared in the bread and we come to the cup. And we know the cup is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. We know that because of his death and resurrection, you remember our sins no more. And but for the asking of faith, we are included in your kingdom forever. As we take this cup and as we make our commitment to serve Jesus anew, bless us with the courage and the strength to be your people. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And the Savior took the cup when he had supped and shared it with his disciples, and we now share the cup with you. This cup is the cup of the new covenant. Drink ye all. God would set aside this bread and this cup for those of our number who are not here this day because of sickness or the distance of miles. Our Father and God, it has been good to come to your table and to again accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. We pray, Lord, that your Spirit will remain among us as we leave this house of prayer. May we continue to find strength and spiritual support from this communion. We ask, Lord, that you will bless each of us in our lives, giving to each of us the ability to serve well the Master for us. And this we ask in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's stand and sing one verse of my faith looks up.
up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and in the life everlasting.